everyone, my name is Pastor Isaac Chua and I currently serve as the pastor right here at Wellington Methodist Church. This year in 2023, our church is celebrating our 150th anniversary. Wow, 150 years. God has been so faithful to our church throughout all these years, generation after generation, and what a witness this church has been in the town of Wellington. So to commemorate our 150th anniversary, we decided um, to make a movie, a documentary of sorts, right, to remember what God has been doing. And so in this video, in this documentary, uh, we are going to look back at the history of our church, how our church began 150 years ago, and some of the highlights, memories, uh, you will hear interviews with young and old alike, uh, and to hear about what God is still doing and how we look ahead to the future. We hope this video will be a treasured memory for many years to come. So let's roll. In the beginning, that seems like a good place to start. After all, those are the first three words in the book of Genesis, as well as the Gospel of John. But let us remember that God existed before those three words, and with a, a word, God spoke our existence into being. 1873 really wasn't the beginning for us here in Wellington. Sure, it's a date when we can say that it all began that God was at work long before those first settlers came to this area. John Wesley, the most prominent founder of Methodism, said, I look upon the whole world as my parish. And so Methodism reached the shores of the United States in the mid-1700s. Methodism would persevere through the Revolutionary War and make its way north and south and move ever westward. It would overcome the unbearable struggle of a nation torn apart with the Civil War, and in its wake, seeds of faith and hope were planted. Some of those seeds made their way along the Chisholm Trail and were planted here high above the banks of the Slate Creek. We are the fruits of their labor, and so many that would follow and are yet to come. I sat down and talked with uh, local historian Jim Bales at the Chisholm Trail Museum about the influence of the Chisholm Trail on Wellington and its early beginnings in Sumner County. Well, I would, I would say that, you know, Wellington wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the Chisholm Trail. Everybody that came to this area had to come down from Paola North, uh, down the Chisholm Trail, or up from Texas, which we had three of our founding fathers were from Texas. Two of them were Confederate soldiers that, after the war, they came up here. And then the other one was a family from Texas. All this land south of Wichita to the Oklahoma border and from uh, the Missouri border to the Colorado border all belonged to the Osage Indian tribe. It was uh, pretty much given to them in 1833. And then in 1865, the buffalo had all been killed off. This was basically their hunting ground. And they wintered over on the east side uh, by Missouri, and they would come over every summer and hunt buffalo over by Bluff Plate Creek and Medicine Lodge and uh, Harper, those kind of areas. And so in 1865, the Osages were smart enough, they saw that the buffalo were no more, and so they sold their lands back to the government for a dollar and a quarter acre, and then they took their money, went south, and bought their uh, reservation uh, down in Pahuska. Uh, so in 1867, they opened this land up for a homestead, uh, but of course that was in the process. They didn't allow people to come and home homestead the property until 1870, um, the fall or spring of 1870. So in that first year, uh, spring of 1871, um, 
several people came down uh, to homestead uh, this region. There were some people came down in 1869, and there absolutely were, there were a few Osage Indians still here camping out and living on the creeks and such. Um, but by uh, 1870, late 1870, then uh, a few more stragglers started moving into the area to stake their claims. The governor at the time uh, appointed uh, a little area um, about three and a half miles southeast of here as Meridian, and it was going to be the uh, county seat. Sumner City was already here. Now, Sumner City doesn't exist today, but it was north of Wellington Lake about um, four or five plus miles. And it was a, uh, an outpost or a uh, trading post um, as people would travel north and south along the Chisholm Trail, they would pass through that and exchange horses, get some ammunition, some food, that kind of thing, and then make their way to the next trading post, which was down at Caldwell. So Sumner City was centrally located in the county, and it was also thought to be going to become the uh, county seat. But some investors got into Governor Harvey and persuaded him to make Meridian the county seat. So uh, those guys moved to Meridian and set up their little uh, tents and were going to start their city there. Several uh, pioneers from Paola uh, came down and they went to Meridian and were going to set up business in Meridian, but they couldn't get the Meridian town designers to get away from their 24 hour, uh, seven day a week card game long enough to uh, buy some or sell some plots. And this angered them. So they went upstream up the Slate Creek a little ways to this location and decided we're just going to start our own little town. And uh, most of those I can remember, uh, Dr. P.A. Wood, uh, C.R. Godfrey, um, is most of the people that you see on the city plat, uh, there were eight of them that started the town. And so that's basically how the town got to this location. Then, because they were fighting over the county seat, uh, our forefathers, Mr. Godfrey and Mr. Uh, Dr. Wood, went over to Sumner City and told those people, hey, if you guys will uproot and move over here to Wellington, we'll give you free land uh, and help you move your buildings. There were probably, I think, 14 buildings set up in Sumner City by that time. They were building pretty fast. And about half of them moved their buildings, lock, stock, and barrel, loaded them up on wagons and pulled them with 40 mule teams and pull them around the creek heads and bring them into Wellington and set them up on Main Street. So we had instant city growth and that allowed Wellington to kind of capitalize on that and gain the county seat. And there was probably 40, 50 uh, families here at the time, uh, mostly living in tents. Uh, Dr. Wood lived underneath his wagon uh, for the first uh, summer. God Dr. Godfrey had the second building up and his was his drugstore, which he brought his plate glass window all the way from Paola and put it in a log cabin building, and that drugstore was right there where the Stewart building is today. Uh, the first business was Sherman's Grocery or Mercantile or across the street from Stewart's right there on that corner. And so that was gonna be, then when they plotted out the town, there was supposed to be a town square there, and the town square would have been the uh, 100 South Block of Washington. But they got greedy and decided they needed more money for the town, so they sold all those lots, and so there wasn't a town square after all. So the, actually the first household in town was owned by uh, Captain Lewis K. Meyer, who was a, a Civil War veteran. Uh, captain and he came here and plotted the property just south of the tracks on Washington Street. That was his uh, land. And he also was an engineer, so he was the one that plotted out the city. The city basically started about on the corner of Lincoln, um, uh, yes, Lincoln and Washington Street. Any street on, on town that is lettered or numbered, that's all the original plot that L.K. Myers laid out. The, the very first church established uh, was the Presbyterian Church. 
Dr. P.A. Wood's wife, uh, who is buried out at our cemetery, she was, uh, I can't say enough good about him. While he was trying to heal the sick and stuff, she would be the nurse that took care of them. And she was very religious as well, and she uh, pushed for uh, the Presbyterian Church to get started. Her and a couple other, uh, found, I think there were eight of them, that started the Presbyterian Church. Now we're talking 1872, I believe and the Methodists were right behind them in 1873. But, you know, back then there weren't, uh, they didn't have any buildings and they had uh, traveling ministers and they'd have church services. But in between that time, I'm sure that the members would get together and hold Sunday services or prayers or something like that. Well, by the time they got the uh, courthouse built, the city building, um, they would hold services in there and every denomination would hold their services in the same building. And then later, when they built the schoolhouse, they would hold them in the schoolhouse. And it wasn't until 1878, I think, when the Methodists finally decided they wanted to build a proper building. And so they started organizing and, and uh, getting their money together to do that. Uh, there is an interesting story I come across where well, they had raised all the money but like $1,900 to pay for the first building. So they started taking money from their parishioners and the first one to donate was a little girl who said that her uncle gave her a silver dollar when he went to California and she wanted to donate it to the church building. So she was the very first to donate out of the parishioners' funds. After they first got here and they're all living in their tents, they tried to put out a crop. Corn was a pretty big crop that they tried to put out. Well, the, in 1873, they've only been here two years, that a, a, a huge grasshopper uh, plague and pretty near wiped out most of the pioneers who had their uh, crops planted. If you had other crops beside corn, you might have survived, but a lot of them didn't. And so a lot of uh, pioneers had to move on or go back east or uh, they just perished altogether. Wellington, as it grew, uh, you know, lots of buildings of maybe two or three blocks of buildings downtown. Uh, we had a fire in 1883, November of 1883, which burnt a whole city block down. After that fire is when they uh, decided, well, no more buildings are going up downtown unless they're made out of brick. They passed an ordinance there, so that's, that's when all the brick uh, construction started happening. But that took a hit on, well, there were probably two or three businesses that didn't uh, rebuild. And then, of course, we had the tornado of 1892 that wiped out another uh, two blocks uh, of downtown and probably about eight or nine blocks of residential houses. Your Methodists moved to, I think it was G Street. Yeah, they survived. Whereas the Lutheran, the Presbyterian, uh, even the Congregational Church, I think it was right across the street from where they were before. So uh, they probably hit some damage. Uh, yeah, it was all the churches in town but the Methodist Church survived and then uh, right after that uh, that tornado why they opened up the land uh, Indian land run in 1893 and a lot of people that had been through the tornado said I'm moving to Oklahoma where I can get some free land start all over again so at the time the tornado hit Wellington had like 14,000 uh, inhabitants and it was growing it was growing faster than Wichita was at the time but then the tornado hit and then the land run hit and uh, and Wellington hasn't actually moved at all. It's been about 9,000 population since then. So uh, it was hard times. It was not easy. Uh, so as you know, Wellington was founded as a community in 1871. And there were itinerant preachers or circuit riders, as they were also called, that served this area, and they were part of what was considered to be the Oxford Circuit. And in April of 1873, uh, a Methodist circuit rider was here in Wellington. He requested that any Methodist would stay after the meeting, after the services were over, and talk about the organization of a church for Wellington. And so there were four ladies, uh, three of whom were married, one was not, and uh, children there, no men other than the pastor. And it was decided to start a church in Wellington. 
So that was in April of 1873, and it was organized, and it was served by itinerant pastors coming in. The first pastor came on board in late 1873 into the community, and he served for a year. Likewise, same in 1874 and then 1875. And then uh, after that, we got into more what we're used to in the Methodist faith of a, of a multi-year charge for the pastors, some two years, some five years, whatever, just different things. But initially, they worshiped in houses of some of those original organizers of the church. And it says in the history of the church that at one time they worshiped in a storeroom on Washington Avenue, which is what most of us refer to as Main Street. But uh, they worshiped there until in 1878, they decided to build a church, the first church that was here. And uh, it was a Methodist Episcopal church because that's how we were known at that time. And it was built over here at the corner on the northeast corner of Harvey and Jefferson, where Lonnie Cooper's office is today. They served in that church until uh, 1888. And at that time, because that was in the business district, somebody really wanted the property fairly badly and they paid almost double what it cost to build the church and the parsonage. And uh, so they moved and built a second church. The second church was built at the corner of 4th and G Street, which is approximately two blocks south and about two blocks west of where we are today uh, in the church at Harvey in Jefferson. Uh, and they served in that church until uh, the, like 1911, 1912. And they decided to build a new sanctuary, which was the Emmy Church that was dedicated or completed in 1913. And that church served the needs of this congregation until the 1979, 1980 time. And that's when the new sanctuary was built and the new fellowship hall. Now, also during that time, besides just the sanctuary that was built in 1913, or finished in 1913, education building that we still have today was completed in 1951. Stewart Chapel was built during that time frame. This, this property, this half block that we're on, was actually acquired in about six different plats, if you will. And then, of course, we acquired the plat where the uh, garage, the storage building sets today on the southwest corner of this block. And uh, that's kind of how the church moved through those various congregations. Church experienced some pretty rapid growth in, uh, in the mid-1870s. In 1874, the membership was 76, and in 1875, it grew to 200 members, so almost tripling in size, and continued to have some pretty rapid growth. We've gone through the membership records, and those records go all the way back to 1873, so it's fascinating to look in there, and it's not just membership, it's births, deaths, marriages, baptisms. Some of the names that are included in our earliest history are names that a lot of us would still recognize as people who have been here or their, their family members have been here. You know, Jesus told us to consider the lily. He didn't say just take a glance and walk by. I think we need to consider the symbolisms that we have here. You drive up to the church and we have Celtic crosses on this sanctuary. We have a cross on, Celtic cross on the Stuart Chapel. And as you walk in the educational building, you'll see symbols there that represent learning. And inside we have so much um, and we need to consider it. The stained glass in churches began in the Middle Ages. You probably know that. And um, many people couldn't read. So they were taught about God and about Jesus and his love through their windows, their stained glass windows. And we still carry that tradition today of teaching, but we need to learn the language of the symbols. The stained glass in our church um, represents four different periods of time, according to when it was installed. Our oldest pieces are 
the Good Shepherd, and in the Garden of Gethsemane. Those are larger pieces of glass, and they have painting on them to bring out a lot of the features. Then the next glass would have been the chapel. That glass is exquisite. It was installed in the 50s. Um, those pieces are smaller pieces and brilliant pieces of glass. I encourage you to go look at those. They don't have as much painting on them to bring out the features. It's in the glass in the Stuart Chapel. In the sanctuary, the three lancet windows in the front featured Jesus in the center, of course. And then on the left-hand side is Matthew and Mark. On the right-hand side is Luke and John. We have two apostles in there. On the wall, the east wall of the church, is the story from Genesis, from creation on it. The, you'll see the flood, and um, I encourage you to look at those. In Fellowship Hall, we have the story of the Trinity, God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. And uh, you walk around the room and you can follow that. The fourth kind of glass that we have is faceted glass, and it's in the Fellowship Hall. It is the rose window. Rose windows are traditionally put in the west wall because the sun, well, shine in there most of the, the day. And um, that one is the story of Pentecost. You can see the seven symbols around the edge. Uh, and um, the Holy Spirit is the descending dove. Uh, it's quite a beautiful piece and I encourage people to look at that one. We do have, I didn't mention two older pieces that we have. In the windows of the old church, we had medallions that were about that big, and uh, those were removed. And we have one down on the, the um, main floor and one on the second floor. There are, I counted 13 kinds of crosses in the church. There may be more, but at least there are 13. And I learned of a new one that I didn't know about, and it's called a portate cross. It is the one that is at an angle like this as Jesus carried it on his, carried it in the cross. It was an angle and he was pulling it up. I invite you to study the, uh, the symbols that we have because they're rich and full and you can learn the story of God and of Jesus through our symbols. I began working in the library just soon after we came here, and uh, I love this room. I love the uh, the books we have. The information is here, and uh, we used to work once a week. It's not so easy to do that anymore, but uh, the library is a precious place for me. It's one of my favorite spots in this church. So. Uh, I invite everybody to come in. It's it's a wonderful place. So I've been a pastor here for almost three and a half years. I started in July of 2020. And in my time here, I've seen how, you know, God has indeed been, been here with us at the church. Um, God uses so many different people to bring about his purposes, his, his ministry. Um, I've, I've definitely seen that. Um, I've seen how people come together um, to, to work together um, and, and make the church run. During my time here, we've had um, several difficult things that we have had to work through. Uh, you know, in 2020, 21, you know, we had to work through um, the global pandemic of COVID-19, and that was not easy. Um, but we stuck through it, you know, God continued to be with us. We did online services, we, we came back in, you know, and, and slowly recovered. And so we, we saw that, that God continued to be with us and, and people came together, stuck together, um, and, and we made it through. Um, and then in the last year, 2022, um, you know, we had to go through another um, difficult period in our church, going through um, the disaffiliation, um, 
And that was, again, that was not easy, yeah, but we worked through the difficult topics um, and, and discussions and, and, and talked about how we can continue to stick together as a church. Um, and now we are, we have moved past that. Well, we are part of the global Methodist church in the, in the new denomination. And we continue to fix our eyes um, on, on what is most important. Um, and that is to, to tell the good news of Jesus um, to young and old alike. We moved to Wellington in 1967. Pastor Lyman Johnson came over to the bank and, and asked me, he said, Dick Wilson has been head usher of this church for 20 years and he would like to retire. And I wondered if you would, would uh, consider taking over as head usher. He retired after 20 years, I retired after 40 years. <laughs> In 1981, I was approached to become treasurer of the church. It isn't near as involved as it used to be because I used to have to do everything with all the tax tax returns and withholding and all that. But yeah, I've been treasurer for ever since 1981. We joined the Sunday school class not long after we started attending here, and at that time it was called the Come Double. We changed the name to the Searchers, and, but they, they really, they just become like your family. We came here from Corbin United Methodist Church in, well, 55 years ago, and um, have been in the Searchers class. Well, it was originally called Come Double, but we changed it Searchers class all those years and uh, those people are dear to us i'll still say us um, i love the music of this church i love the organ and to hear the, that played the piano and the bells I rang 40 years in the bell choir so i have a real attachment to that and um, i just have appreciated the music of this church through the years well, I'm Larry Anderson and been part of this church since 1976. And when I think about the church, uh, I mainly think about people. And when you start mentioning people, then that's dangerous because you're going to forget somebody who's real special to you and you just didn't remember them. But <clears throat> I, I, I think I want to start with Dorothy Breen, who the young folks won't remember, but she was a widow later when we came to, to town. She told us about the Bone Road. And if you're my age or older, you may remember the Bone Road, but she grew up in western Kansas in a dugout, about a quarter mile up to a half mile away from her grandmother, who lived in a dugout. And so she would go visit the grandmother frequently, and at night, um, they were afraid she'd get lost coming home. So they gathered a bunch of old beach bleached uh, buffalo bones and laid them out, and the moonlight on the <laughs> on the bones was her bone road home. But she was a delightful Christian lady. Uh, one other person I have to mention would be John T. Stewart and Linda, uh, who uh, have supported this church for decades, their family. But the first time I met John T. Stewart was in the entry to the old sanctuary. Big, tall, nice looking guy in a suit. And I thought I had met John T. Stewart and he welcomed me to the town, and, and I said, well, uh, I said, well, what do you do? And he says, well, I work out at Plessy, and I farm a little. And that's just how he said it, and I've told him this, but I got the impression that he was working at Plessy at night to keep his farm afloat. So that's just how he presented himself, and he's always that, that, that humble uh, but uh, servant person, and his name is on the plaque out there of the 12 people or so who, uh, uh, were the, the, the group that uh, planned for this new uh, church or for the building, the sanctuary, and the fellowship hall. And um, there's four of us still living, John T. Stewart and Orlean Urban and Bruce Ewing and myself. We came here to visit in March of 76. We sat upstairs in the balcony with our three children. And at that time, uh, they were having someone talk about whether we stay in the sanctuary or or uh, build a new church. 
And so that kind of leads me then into early on that discussion about do we build a new sanctuary in, in Fellowship Hall or stay in the old sanctuary? And, uh, and there were a few people who left the church at that time. I remember some of, of the, 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 the people who uh, I can't, were recruited to, to talk about, you know, we need to stay in the sanctuary. And I probably am wrong on this, but I kind of remember Ken Jones. Uh, and I think he had a, a job, a tough job, uh, but he was kind of their captain. And so he, he promoted the, the old sanctuary. And of course, he was a faithful member of this church forever. I think about what I'm excited about for, uh, for the future is I, I see more evangelism in our church now. And again, I've been here 40 five years almost and we've had lay witness missions that kind of came and went and uh, but i think with your leadership and all your skill we're just doing so many many good things you have great messages very well delivered and the music ministry has always been good in this church always uh you know we've become a praying church pastor isaac is is strong on us being a praying church and and i guess i've been part of that sunday morning event and he said the other day this has been going on for about a year it doesn't seem that long but but uh and then the the daily uh, the scripture stated that he's got many of us involved in a couple of hundred probably you know we're in, we're in a, a in a environment now where uh ai artificial intelligence or it whatever you want to call it is so important and pastor isaac and all the people here know how to do that you know people can be in a, a jungle somewhere and and with uh, battery-powered devices, they can they can they can hear the word. So, uh, I I just feel that uh, with the global ministry and uh, the the new uh, leadership and energy that that uh, we're going to be a more important uh, tool of Christian evangelism here in Wellington and hopefully the surrounding area. And uh, you know that message uh, is not easy to to. to to impart to somebody. I was in the church my whole life, and I was 33 years old before I understood that I'm saved because of what Jesus did for me, not because of what I do for him. And that's, that's an important thing that we have to, I think, it was important for me to understand. I've been in the uh, uh, confirmation class a couple times with Pastor Isaac, and it's just excellent the way I think he, he shares uh, the Trinity. I've learned a lot in that confirmation series with him and, and the kids and the other mentors. Uh, I guess uh, I have a list of people that I uh, would have mentioned. I kind of wanted to mention uh, Lloyd Bliss. Uh, that's Linda's dad. And I knew him just for a few years, but he sang in the choir. And a pretty independent guy, a very strong voice. And uh, he, uh, he uh, had some uh, convictions that he held very tightly and was willing to, to share uh, uh, with us if, if I'd sit still and listen to him. But uh, Ron Shepard and Betty Shepard and, and Dale Wilson and, and, and Dick Wilson and, and uh, the Pyatts. And uh, again, you start naming people and I'm going to forget people. So I think that uh, I'll probably stop and take a breath right now. Not many have walked the bone roads that Dorothy Breen did in her youth, but as Dr. Anderson illustrates, there have been so many who have walked along beside us over these past 150 years. Folks who have all made an impact on our lives in ways that we may never fully realize or understand. We take our memories of them with us as we join new faces and new names along the road. What I like about the church is Sunday school and Bible school. What I like about the church is um, it's really fun and um, I, uh, we get to learn about Jesus and how he died on the cross to save our lives from sinning. What I like about church is I love KCC and I love learning about Jesus. I think some of the strengths here at our church um, are definitely our ministry to, to the, the younger generation for kids and youth. We have a wonderful program 
um, called KCC, Kids Crusaders Club. Um, and, and they do a wonderful job ministering to these children from K through fifth grade um, on Wednesdays. And I have been in here multiple times seeing how the children jump up and down with the music, praising Jesus um, and getting so excited to learn about um, what it means to, to be a follower of Jesus. And that is such a great ministry that this church has been able to provide, not just for church members. We have, we have kids who are loosely connected to the church who come and attend, and it has been a, a blessing, a wonderful blessing um, to see these children uh, getting to learn about the stories of Jesus. I'm Terry Campbell. And I'm Gwen Stalkup. We have led KCC, Kids Crusader Club, for 28 years. It began after a lay witness mission, and uh, I felt the Lord was leading me to create a club for kids, something where they would grow in their knowledge of Jesus and develop Christian friendships. And I asked Gwen, hey, you want to do this with me? <laughs> and and Wednesday happened to be my day off from work. And uh, also, my one of my sons had already started going to an after-school program at a, uh, a Baptist church that was near Kennedy School. So it's like, well, it'd be nice for him to come to our church and have that yeah. available. Yeah. So in the fall of 1995, we started the first Kids Crusader Club, and we had about 12 kids, uh, most of which were from Gwen's neighborhood. She would load her van up and bring them to church. My three kids and the neighbor's three kids, so I had six that I brought she, my... So 50% of the kids were from <laughs> Gwen's neighborhood or her family. We studied the Armor of God was our first study. Mm -hmm. And I always felt like this was so God's thing. Like I would wake up in the night with, I would wake up with a craft for the next Wednesday, or I would wake up with a lesson in the middle of the night. And that's not me, that's, that's God at work. Um, this is God's program. And it has grown over the years. We have, we started with 12, and Gwen and I used to pray, Oh, Lord, can we please, please. have 25? Please bring us more children. And, and he did. He did. <laughs> One year we had averaged like 72 kids, and uh, we had our first day is always a splash day. So we transport the kids to my house, and we do these water games. And we had 87 kids to transport that day, and I thought, what did Gwen and I pray for? <laughs> Very um, abundant. <laughs> but it, it has, yeah, it's been, it's been good. And we've had ebbs and flows of, of in numbers, but always we've had a great team of people who have felt this, had the same passion to tell Je kids about Jesus and to grow them up in the church and develop friendships with other Christian kids so they can stand strong in their community. It was a way to be more creative and we had more time than Sunday school. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that part was, yeah. was awesome. Yeah, to get, dig a little to deeper, do, yeah. go a little further. Some of our favorite memories of KCC. Well, the programs, we got to be creative with backdrops and, <laughs> and the kids got to act. And, mm -hmm. Um, oh, and the skits. The skits. The skits. Oh, kids love, could be love to do skits. Creative. With, that, with I didn't realize stuff. that. When we started doing, the kids started acting out the um, Bible stories, mm -hmm. and they loved that. We had no idea how much they enjoyed <laughs> that, which led to Christmas programs. And this is kind of neat. Nancy Teason has made snacks for 28 years. The one that always gets me is Puppy Chow which is made from like, you know, the cereal mix. And I think about like, what would that amount look like today? That she's made. That she's made, like, <laughs> would it be a pickup load? Would it be a truck load? Would it be a semi load? You know? She's made a lot of puppy chow in 28 years. We try to adopt missions through the year and going out and delivering um, to our older people is one mission. Um, serving as candle lighters is another mission. And then we try to reach out beyond us, and uh, we do Operation Christmas Child. And the kids get to pack shoe boxes for kids in other countries. And in doing that, 
they learn that there are kids in other places that don't know Christmas because they don't know about Jesus. And that is always such a an aha moment, I guess, mm -hmm. for kids mm -hmm. that they think everybody's just like them. So that's those are our missions. <laughs> Every year is different. The kids are different. The we do a different curriculum every year. Uh, they're always they're always children. They're always families. They're always there's our staff is wonderful and believes in the ministry. Um, we have staff people that were kids once. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> and we and do, now, and we're we're um, and we're seeing even seeing our grandchildren, our grandchildren come through. Uh, my fourth one is a, is a fifth grader this year. Yeah. And, uh, and then I've got another one coming on, so we've got to keep this going. That's true. <laughs> That's true. For the next, next few years here. <laughs> First of all, I didn't even know this church was here till I met my wife, and she told me that she goes to this church, and I started coming to this church. One of the very first things that struck me was everybody was so friendly, and they welcomed me. I was the type of guy that didn't want to go to church a lot, but ever since I've been coming to this church and received the Holy Spirit, uh, I want to be part of the church. I want to be involved. Right now I'm involved with mentoring. I never imagined I would do th such a thing. The Spirit is very strong with this church and keeps drawing me back. And I enjoy that more than anything else. Even right now when I'm talking, I have goosebumps talking about it. It's a very personal relationship that I have. It's not the building, it's the love inside coming from God and it's radiating out to the members. What I feel that the church means to me is that it helps me with, my, uh, with worshiping Jesus and that we are the body of Christ. So and Christ, is, Christ is the head and the church is the body. And hopefully I uh, can be a, be a part of that body, the, the ears or the eyes or the, or the nose. So that's what the church means to me. Um, this church is like a family to me. We started coming here um, probably 10 or 12 years ago. My kids were in middle school and they got involved in youth group. Their friends were um, active here and the youth group was growing. And so that's how we got, um, the kids got involved and then... I got involved and just been here ever since. Another strength that we have here at our church is our youth program. Uh, we have a wonderful youth group um, here at our church. You know, we have 60, 70, 80 youth that comes to our youth group uh, on a Wednesday uh, night. You know, when I first arrived here in, in 2020, I heard about how, uh, how great this, the youth program uh, has, has been. Right? And it was all entirely run by volunteers. Uh, like many other churches, you know, have a full-time youth director and they don't even get the same number of youth that come. And that's a great testament to, to the laity and, and how people are invested, right, to, to create a wonderful youth program and the people in the community know to want to come and send their youth um, to our church. And since then, in the last two and a half years, um, since 2021, uh, we have hired a full-time youth director. We saw the need and we saw the, um, that, that this is a, an area that we definitely want to keep it going and keep growing, keep investing in, in the lives of these young people. And in Bailey, we found a perfect fit and she has continued to grow our program um, and invest in the lives of these um, young people, middle school and high school alike. I'm Bailey Struble. I'm the youth director here at the Methodist Church. I've been in this position since um, 2021, so just about two and a half years now. Um, the youth group is really growing and thriving. It's a vibrant group of middle school and high school students. Um, this year we've seen a lot of growth. Um, we have about 75 to 80 students every Wednesday. I think if you ask anybody in the community of Wellington right now about what they know about the Methodist Church, they're going to talk about the youth programs and the size of the youth group and just, um, yeah, we're, we're pretty well known in the community for our youth programs. So on a normal Wednesday, we start um, in the sanctuary, we meet, we have worship and um, devotion and prayer and then um, the opportunity to partake in communion, um, which is awesome because many of our students um, are not connected to a church on Sunday. 
um, with their family. So when they come on Wednesday, they get to experience what it's like to worship and um, pray and take part in communion, and um, that's exciting. And then normally we'll go into small groups, but sometimes we switch it up and um, we'll play games, and that's fun just to see the fellowship and relationship buildings that happen through laughing and being silly. So this year we're studying the book of John. So how we do small groups is I have 13 other um, adults who help me lead and teach on Wednesdays. And so we split the kids up by um, age and gender and they get to go into their small group and they'll share a little bit about their week, their highs and their lows. And then um, they'll go into whatever passage from John that we're reading for the week and just read it together and talk about what sticks out to them and what, what they think the purpose of the passage is and um, what Jesus is teaching us through um, the Gospel of John, which is really exciting. Um, I think more exciting than the fact that we have so many students is that I know that each week when the students come through the door, they're gonna encounter um, and have a meaningful connection with an adult, but also that they're gonna hear the Gospel. And um, my prayer each week is that God is planting seeds in the lives of these um, young people and that one day, either in the future, near future or far future, they'll remember the things that they learned at youth group and become faithful servants um, for his kingdom. So I think it's exciting to think about the future because um, knowing where I am at now and how God has called me to ministry and um, I'm a product of the youth ministry at this church. I. Um, started coming to this church because of the youth groups and I get excited thinking about the students in our youth ministry now that God's going to use in his kingdom be it as pastors or youth leaders or missionaries wherever um, and I I know there's at least several who are already feeling called to ministry but I know there's more out there who um, will be called later on and that's exciting. In 1907, for example, the church started supporting a, a mission family that was in China, and that was continued up until the early 50s. I actually have the name of that first pastor that we supported. It, it was the Reverend Lauren E. Humphreys, and he was in a community called Fu Chao, China, and it's titled Parish Abroad. So it was an outreach of this church. And obviously, in a country as large as China, uh, the, it was felt in the early teens that we, in addition to providing uh, monetary support for that pastor and the family, they also needed to get an automobile. So the church purchased an automobile and had it shipped to China for that family to utilize, obviously for the pastor to utilize in his outreach to various activities that he was involved in. The church continues to support and encourage those who were called into a ministry of mission. In the 1970s and 80s, the church supported the Fulton family in their aviation ministry work in Zaire, Africa. A group of ladies uh, from this congregation traveled with others to Uganda, Africa. Among that group of ladies was Michaela Bradbury, who continues to serve in that country along with her husband, Alan, and a four-year-old named Travis, who lives with them full-time. They are teaching children about the love of Christ and equipping them with the tools that they need to stand strong and make a difference in their part of the world. The Edwards brothers are an important part of the mission story of this church. Jeremy spent several years proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ to the people of India. Jordan continues to work with college and university students at a key time in their lives. Brock is working with the ministry called Unto and is their national video editor traveling all over the world. There are so many others from this church who have been called into ministry either as clergy or in other capacities. We praise God for the call upon their lives and we look to the future knowing others will follow in their footsteps. There are many things I like about this church. I've been here ever since I was a kid and I love going to KCC and going to youth group and Sunday school and being involved in the church and also seeing all of the different people 
that go to our church in the community in Wellington. It's really great. I've only been at this church for about a year, but so far I've loved everything about it. I've made a lot of more new friends and build more relationships with others, and um, I'm just really happy to be a part of this church. So uh, we joined the church earlier this year. Um, it's been a blessing to us. One of the things that we found um, to be really um, that drew us in was just the welcomeness. Everybody's been really great about you know um, doing that, and then um, we've joined a Sunday school. Uh, we were at the 150th celebration outside in the park. It's just the church really thinks outside the box in ways to serve the Lord and serve the community. And that's one thing that we really appreciate. So that's why we've um, jumped in full fledged. Uh, one thing that I enjoy about this church is how it supports uh, me with my spiritual gifts and gives me opportunities to use them. And also just kind of having like a second family and having people that support me and stuff that I do and God-sized dreams that I have, and I, I just really love this church and what, what they do for me. Um, it's like a home and where everyone is supportive to each other. How supportive the people are. <laughs> yeah, and you can make new friends here. It's easy, like, to be able to talk to people and, like, mm -hmm. you know that they're going to, like, always be there for you when you mm -hmm. need them. You know, you can also, like, talk to them about your problems so they'll help you through it. So, mm -hmm. Uh, what this church means to me is sometimes I think of it as just like my second family and kind of my happy place, my uh, peace place. Yeah. This Wellington church to me is family. Um, my kids have grown up here. I've gotten to see a lot of kids grow up here. And so when I think of this church, I think of family. Well, when we moved back to Wellington after living in Wichita, this church became where I found my friends, I met new people, I felt part of the family. It's meant a lot to me, especially with, during the troubled times that I've been going through recently. So I am grateful for the people and the support that I've gained here. I moved to Kansas when I was six. That would have been in 1960, and uh, been a member of this church ever since then, and attended almost every Sunday except the four years that I was in college, and it's been a great church. Some of my favorite memories would be um, my aunt and uncle, Janice and Kenneth Jones, were members of the Keystone class, and that was the... <clears throat> large adult class at the time and they had fabulous Christmas parties here and they had uh, Santa Claus would come after they had a big covered dish dinner and Santa Claus would come and made sure that they had presents for all the kids and oh gosh it was in the old church down in the fellowship hall and I they had doors that you could raise and lower to make into smaller classrooms and they always had to all be open because it was so crowded and lots of kids, families were larger back then. And that's one of my best memories as a young child. Um, my Sunday school teachers were an important part to me of this church. I, two couples that stand out the most for me would probably be um, Dr. Marvin and Betty Bean and they were middle school or junior high teachers, and I don't know how they stood us. I know we were probably horrible, but they hung in there with us. And then um, also Bonnie Moody and Jean Moody were important parts of this church. They were youth sponsors and um, very important. And um, it was just a great time to be a kid growing up in this church. We had a young kids choir, it was called the Bircham Choir, and um, we had a youth choir and then an adult choir. A lot of kids, um, a lot of good memories. The church has been my foundation. Um, I was a member of a church in New York before we moved here, and um, so many uh, older people that obviously are not here any longer that um,
played such an important role in my life, whether it was Bible school teachers or Sunday school teachers, the ministers. I uh, played the organ for Dr. Johnson when he was the minister here. And he told me at one time, I probably heard his sermons more than anybody except his wife because I would go to first service so Steve could go with me and then I would stay and play for second service. And if it was the church's turn to do the worship at the nursing homes and so on and so forth. Uh, so I sometimes heard his sermon five or six times a day, a Sunday, and uh, I enjoyed every minute of it. Probably this, I don't know if this will make it or not, but the funniest thing I can remember is going to the jail to play. And it was pretty scary and um, that's <laughs> left a big impression in my life. The, uh, the people that were in jail did not really appreciate us being there. And one of the guys that was behind bars took his cup and was doing this across the bars while we were trying to play the organ and sing. So that was always a funny memory, I guess. But it also taught me that you have to be a church that does outreach too. And that's an important part of our church today. And I think I learned it at a very young age. Riding in the elevator was a big deal too. And we would turn the, you know, my brothers would turn the power off and turn the lights out. And then we'd be stuck in the church elevator going nowhere. Um, that's just a personal memory. I can't think of really doing that with the other kids, but um, that was fun. The future of the church is um, very important, obviously. Again, I think outreach is probably one of the ways that we could do better, but um, it's hard to sometimes do that. I always felt like it was important when we did the summer meal program started by Jan Cordy and um, then kind of taken over after a couple of years that she did it. And, we at one year we served about 150 kids three days a week lunch during the summertime that was a big year but i think of all the people that helped with that it was a lot of people it took four or five volunteers every day to make all those meals for the kids but it was also a good time of fellowship you're not just working you're enjoying it too um, i know there's more that we need to do in our community and just local, I think, is, is very important. Our Sunday school class is, uh, has been trying to figure out a way to help with some dental bills of people in the community. We haven't gotten very far with that. That's something I hope we can work on and figure out. And again, just keeping young kids involved. We're blessed to have such a wonderful youth program here and young kids, KCC and the preschool and that's sometimes how we get the parents involved. I don't have any memories other than being in this church. Um, my grandparents attended this church, uh, both the Argos and the Ewings. Uh, my parents were married in the church and attended most of their lives at least. I think my dad all of his life. Um, I met my wife in this church. I was in third grade when we moved to Wellington and so and we my family um, started attending then I was confirmed in this church by the wrong name the pastor confirmed me by the name of one of my friends who was also in the in the confirmation class but I'm pretty sure I'm still confirmed um, <laughs> I used to play the piano for the middle school choir. Archer Choir. Archer Choir. And Bruce's grandpa. Grandpa Thornton says, I think you ought to ask her out. <laughs> Very wise man. <laughs> so. The rest is history. <laughs>
uh, Burke and I, Greg and Julia, Adam and Angela, and Ryan and Megan, also Ashley and Jacob are members. We have you know, grandchildren that are here yet, so a lot of Ewings. <laughs> it is home to us. And, and in some ways, you know, the church has changed, of course, but in the important ways, it's still the same. Hi, I'm Andrea Day. I've been coming to the Methodist Church since 1967 when I got married. Uh, but my earliest memory of this church was when my brother got married for the first time here at the Methodist Church, and it was such a beautiful church. I was probably in junior high, and uh, I can remember sitting in the sanctuary with the big dome and thinking, oh, I want to go to church here sometime, and... I came from the Mayfield Federated Church, and so a very small church, but I was so impressed with just the building at that age. And uh, so here I am. <laughs> Thank heavens I married somebody that went to church here, and, and so I got to attend church here. Um, some of my earliest memories, I taught Sunday school for, I don't even remember how many years, but the group that they started with me with were they were in third grade love those kids and they moved on to fourth grade and i stayed behind on third grade a few weeks into um sunday school the next year they asked me if i would move up with that group so i did and then fifth grade came around so i moved up with them then I stayed with those kids until they were in just out of junior high, I think. Another member, memory that I have is Kathy Vickers and I started the Care and Share team. Mm -hmm. And uh, she called me one day and said she had an idea and she wondered if I would help her with it. And so we started that and, and it was very successful and I, it's still going on. One of the most interesting memories I have is I can't remember who the minister was at that time, but they asked me when I had the flower shop if I would make blue bows to put on people's front porches on Christmas morning for It's a Boy. And so I bought ribbon that was like three inches wide in blue velvet, which is really hard to make a bow out of, and I made 400 bows. Some of the most significant things about this church is when I walk into the sanctuary, I just get a feeling of peace. Um, I, I love the old church with the big dome and the, and the two aisles and all that, but this one is where my kids were raised. Mm -hmm. And uh, my husband and I attended for years and then he got became ill and couldn't come, but uh, um, but it's not the building, I don't think, that gives me that sense of peace. It's the people. Mm -hmm. It's the, you know, the family, the, a church family. And uh, I feel like a church family is so important. I think another thing that is very significant to me is and thanks to Pastor Isaac, we are becoming a praying church. Um, I attend most times the Sunday morning 7.30 prayer service. And Pastor Isaac has kind of tried to get me out of my comfort zone because I haven't been very, uh, I don't, I haven't prayed out loud a lot. I'm excited about the future of the church, with all the changes we've made this year even, uh, to see where it takes us. One of my favorite things is on Wednesday night uh, to see all the youth in the participating in the service. Um, they, they sing, they serve communion, they get their Bibles out. I asked my great-granddaughter, Rainy, the other day, I said, did you take your Bible to school? 
on the Take Your Bible to School Day? And she goes, yes, I did. And I said, were there a lot of kids that did? And she goes, yeah, quite a few. She goes, and they weren't all from, from our church. And I thought, wow, that's that gives me hope for the future. So that that's exciting to me, too. Um, another thing that I like is that Pastor Isaac is teaching us to make disciples in our community. Didn't used to do that a lot, or maybe it was just me didn't used to do it because I don't like to pray out loud. I don't like to, you know, but uh, so I appreciate that. Uh, about a year and a half ago, I came here a couple Sundays and shortly after that, I received a letter in the mail from Pastor Isaac saying that he was had my name and he was praying for me for the week. And I've always respected the power of prayer. And it's the first time in my life I received a letter like that. And it really meant a lot to me. So I started coming and I just realized how important prayer and prayer life is in this church and how, you know, the, the power of prayer, I'm so aware of it in my own life and in lives of people that I've known and the importance of it. And it just drew me to this church, and I really feel comfortable here. We're the ladies of the Upper Room Sunday School class, and we'd like to tell you things that we appreciate about this church and things that we're thankful for. We're thankful for the friendship, the willingness to help uh, whenever we're asked to help or we need help. People always step up. Um, we... Um, appreciate all of our time together with each other. Uh, we are happy that we have a church that is very active with our youth, our KCC group, our Bible school. We see the youth group growing and active and that means a lot for our future. And what else? What else? Oh, I'm thankful for the uh, years of history that we have and all the people who have moved through this church and had an effect on all of us. Uh, mm -hmm. And I know that there's more people to come that will have effect on us. On us. Um, I appreciate Pastor Isaac and, and his family and all the pastors who have come before him. And we appreciate the activeness of everybody willing just to jump in whenever any, you know, when there's something you don't have to wait really for volunteers. It seems like people are willing and ready. And that that means enough in a bunch, you know, for us to get things done and not. Yeah, when we need desserts, desserts <laughs> <laughs>joined a, a new denomination in the Global Methodist Church. We have an increased emphasis uh, on scripture, on prayer. Uh, we had over 100 people sign up this past year to, to commit themselves to be in the Word daily, uh, to be in scripture, to be in daily devotion. And that is one of the foundational pieces of our faith. Right, to, to seek the Lord, to make time, to make space for Jesus. And I, I see the hunger, the desire um, there in our church. And I think I'm excited about that. So I can't wait to see what God will continue to, to do um, here, here at, at our church um, as he continues to call forth uh, people, young and older, like to serve him, um, to, to worship together, um, and to, to witness for Jesus. We currently have two worship services that we offer. Right now on a Sunday morning, uh, we have a service at 8.45, which is our more traditional service with organ music. And then at 11 o'clock, um, we have a contemporary service with the praise band. Um, and right now here in 2023, both services um, have a, a pretty equal in numbers and not one service isn't dramatically uh, larger than the others, the other one. Um, we can have anyone between 70 to 100 people between each service that comes and worship with us. Uh, over the last couple of years, we also have started a midweek service on, on Wednesday evening as we wanted to offer an, another opportunity uh, for people to come to worship. And the Wednesday night service only uh, occurs throughout the school year. So we, we take a break uh, over um, the summer 
and over Christmas break. Um, and Wednesday night service has also been a great addition here at our church. Um, Wednesday night service uh, is typically uh, the majority of those who come are, are the youth who come to youth group. And, and many of them don't come to church on Sunday. So we wanted to, to provide the opportunity. Although Wednesday night service um, is not um, specifically only for youth, but, but a lot of youth do attend and we wanted to create opportunities to teach them up to worship, right? And, and to teach them to come before the Lord and, and to be in a worshiping community, um, whether they come on Sunday mornings or, or not, we want them to, to experience that worship and to hear a message. Um, another thing that we started doing um, this year is to have communion more regularly. Um, so right now, in all our services, we, we celebrate um, Holy Communion, um, both on our Sunday, morning services and also on Wednesday evening. We really believe that the table of the Lord is central um, to our faith. You know, so each time we come to worship, we want to remember the sacrifice of Jesus, remember the forgiveness of Jesus, remember the presence of Jesus, remember that we are one body, that we, we share the faith together and that Jesus goes with us, that we are not alone. And so for that, I'm, I'm thankful uh, for the direction that this church has taken. And so we thank all of those who over these past 150 years have tirelessly served God and worked to know Christ and to make Christ known. We especially want to thank all of the many pastors who have tended the flock here at Wellington Methodist Church. We praise God that he called each and every one of them to serve alongside us. This is not the end of the story. The late Reverend Ralph Abernathy said, I don't know what the future may hold, but I know who holds the future. God, through the faithful work of the Holy Spirit, has guided us to this place and time. Who knows, perhaps you or the little one sitting next to you will celebrate 200 years in the year 2070. Church, set us a place with your power. 
great is your faithfulness How great is your love for us From generation to generation How great is your faithfulness How great is your faithfulness How great is your love for us From generation to generation How great is your faithfulness From generation to generation How great is your faithfulness